All around the world, there are places that hide a secret past. In some cases, it's obvious to see the devastation. For others, it's not so clear. In this video, we look at beauty spots, craters, and stunning buildings that have disturbing and sometimes puzzling backstories. Before we get started, if you enjoy our documentaries, such as our Murderous Mind series, then consider supporting us on Patreon for just $2 per month. We no longer upload documentaries to YouTube, as we would have to massively water down the topics we talk about in order for them to become ad-friendly. That's why we've had to move them to Patreon. For just $2 per month, you'll get instant access to the documentaries we already have on there, and access to the new documentaries we'll be posting over the next few weeks, which we will be increasing to help entertain all the people who are staying at home. If you're in a position to do so, then please consider supporting and helping us keep up the documentaries. But again, if you're not in a position to pay $2 per month, then email patreon at topfives.co.uk and we will send you the links for free. As always, hit those likes, sit back, and enjoy. The Potomsky Crater Located in central Russia, the enormous Potomsky Crater still remains a mystery. Despite the efforts of scientists who have tried many times to explain the phenomenon, the crater, known locally as the Fire Eagle Nest, was discovered in 1949 by Russian geologist Vadmin Kolpakov in the remote Irkuts region of southeastern Serbia, near the Potomsky River. Kolpakov was baffled by the huge circular mound made of crushed limestone that appeared to be giving off heat and measured 520 feet or 160 meters in diameter and 139 feet or 40 meters in height with another mound in the depressed center, standing 39 feet or 12 meters high. Initially, he believed it was a meteorite crater, and many seemed to agree with him, suggesting it was a fragment from the Tunguska meteorite that exploded in the atmosphere above Serbia in 1909. The discovery left scientists scratching their heads, with some believing the crater was formed by a volcanic phenomena, although there was no sign of any lava, suggesting that it may be a specific type of volcano that was caused by an underground rupture of a deep natural gas pocket. Others believe that it's a cryovolcanism phenomena or ancient ice volcano that dates from the Little Ice Age. For years, the crater was only studied from the ground, but in 1971, the first aerial photograph was taken and the full scale of the crater's special form was revealed. The image piqued the interest of both archeologists and the public and since then, several organized expeditions have climbed the mound. However, much to the despair of the locals, who believe that by climbing it, they are insulting the fire eagle nest that has an evil power that causes deer and other animals to stay away and kill anyone who steps inside. This belief was reinforced in 2005, when the leader of an expedition died unexpectedly shortly after climbing the crater. More bizarre theories are that it is a portal to an underground civilization or the site where a UFO crashed. However, there appears to be no evidence to support any of these theories. What has been confirmed is the crater has a total estimated weight of 1 million tons and is around 500 years old, and it's the only one of its type in the world. The only thing that comes close to it has been found on the moon. However, a more recent study has come up with a more plausible answer it's possible the weird formation has been caused by a phreatic eruption, a steam-driven explosion that occurs when water, either on the ground or below the surface, is heated up by molten rock, and the intense heat causes steam that causes an explosion of hydrous rock and other surface materials to hurtle into the sky. They then land and cool, leaving a baffling crater behind. If this is the real cause of the Potomsky crater, then it would explain why Kolpakov felt heat, and maybe the reason why animals avoid it, and why vegetation may be unable to grow around it. There is one problem with this theory though, it is thought that if there were enough magma and hydrous rock to form one crater, then it would have formed many more in the same area. So for now, despite it being a plausible explanation, it may still not be the explanation. And so the research goes on to unravel the mystery of the Potomsky crater, Chateau de Tresesson. Chateau de Tresesson is a magical looking medieval castle surrounded by a moat in the Brittany region of France. 
but don't be fooled by its beauty and serenity, because this picturesque private residence has a grisly past and is the subject of several legends and ghost stories. It's not certain how old the building is, but it can be traced back as far as the 8th century, although the most documentation dates from the 13th century, when the Tresesson family lived there. Since then, many noble people have occupied the castle. The castle is reputed to also be the home of several ghosts, the most famous concerns Dame Blanche, also known as the White Lady, or the Bride of Tresesson, and the tale behind her demise is disturbing. It is said that when Missier lived in the castle, some poachers in the nearby woods witnessed a most horrific scene. They saw a carriage pulled by two horses stop outside the castle, and two men got out and started digging a grave. They then returned to the carriage and forcibly grabbed a young lady from inside it. The lady was dressed in a white silk bridal gown with a wreath of flowers on her head. The young bride was then thrown into the grave and buried alive. The poachers, horrified by what they saw, alerted the Count and he got his servants to dig her out, but they were unable to save her and she passed away soon after. Another version of the same events says the bride was bricked up in the castle walls by her brothers on the morning of her wedding because she chose a man they did not approve of. Since that dreadful night, the spirit of the young woman dressed in white is said to haunt the roof of the castle when the moon is full. But the White Lady is not the only ghost to haunt the castle. Another member of the Tresesson family also roams the grounds of the castle with his lover. He is the Count's youngest son, who was forced by his father to go on a crusade to the Holy Land, where he tragically died. When his lover learned of his death, she died of a broken heart, and although they weren't buried together, their spirits have been seen walking together along the edge of the nearby forest. The interior of the castle is also famous for its ghost room, in which two phantom card players can be seen arguing, and a headless ghost has been spotted roaming the corridors. If any of you have ever visited this castle, we'd love to hear if you have any stories or encounters to share. Badgebury Forest Badgebury Forest is an area of outstanding beauty near the Sussex and Kent border in the UK. It dates back hundreds of years and is classed as ancient woodland with a mixture of coniferous and deciduous tree species. Today it's an award-winning visitor attraction and is the perfect place for healthy outdoor activities. However, it holds a gruesome secret that has never been solved. On October 23rd, 1979, a woman riding her horse through the forest spotted the body of a woman in the undergrowth. The corpse was badly beaten, mutilated and dumped, although little attempt had been made to conceal the body. The victim had suffered massive injuries and a blood-stained wooden stake found nearby was later identified as the murder weapon. No handbag or means of identification were found with the body, and police believe that the victim had died up to five days prior to her discovery. The severity of the injuries to the woman's face and body made visual identification impossible. The post-mortem revealed the woman was aged between 30 and 35. She was 5 foot 1 inches tall and of thin build. She had brown eyes and straight shoulder length dark brown hair and prominent visibly decaying teeth. She was wearing black shoes, a distinctive floral dress, a black polo neck jumper and yellow blouse. The police believed that the black and white patterned dress was the key to identifying her. The dress was found to have been homemade from furniture fabric and had been altered on multiple occasions. The autopsy also revealed that the victim had an ectopic pregnancy which had been present for four to six weeks, and she would have been bleeding and in severe pain for the last two weeks, so may have visited a doctor in the weeks before her death. Stretch marks on her stomach indicated that she had probably given birth to at least one child. It was also determined she was a non-smoker who lived outside of city pollution and was likely homeless. But despite a fairly detailed description of her appearance and lifestyle, along with a high-profile media campaign to try and identify her, no one came forward. In October 1998, the case was reopened after an investigation by forensic scientists on archived evidence and the case was once again highlighted in the national media as one of a number of such cases that had been reported due to new DNA techniques. 
The new evidence resulted in the arrest of Harry J. R. Pennells in January 1999, and he was charged with the still unidentified murder. Pennells was a lorry driver at the time, who had worked for Henley's Transport in Kent. He had also been interviewed several times, however after specks of blood found in his lorry in 1979 were re-examined and linked to the victim, police were able to make their arrest. Shortly after Pennell's arrest, the victim's case was featured on Crime Watch for a second time in an attempt to identify her. On the program, it was revealed that after the original appeal in 1984, the person who made the black and white dress had made contact. The woman, who was from Stratford-upon-Avon, stated that she'd given the dress to a charity shop, after which police could not trace it. The dress had been altered by the time the victim had it, and an appeal was made for the person who made these alterations to come forward, but no one did. Pennell's trial started on May 4, 2000, at Maidstone Crown Court, where he was accused of picking up the victim in Spitterfields Market in London on October 19, 1979, and taking her to his lorry to a delivery in West Yorkshire, and then back to London to drop her off. But instead taking her back, on the morning of October 20th, he beat her to death with a wooden stake. Pennells told the court that he had picked up a female hitchhiker and admitted that the hitchhiker may have been the victim, but claims that he had dropped her off alive and was innocent of the murder. Witnesses corroborated his story. Samples of blood and flakes of hair found in a sleeping bag on the passenger seat of Pennell's lorry matched the DNA profile of the victim. Additionally, particles of foam from a mattress in the cab of the lorry were found on the victim's dress. So it's clear Pennell had picked up the victim. However, the jury unanimously cleared him of her murder. To date, the woman and her killer have never been identified. It's eerie to think that those who walk through Badgebury Forest and bike through the bug trail may not realise that it's the site of a tragic unsolved murder. The Death Valley Germans Death Valley National Park on the California-Nevada border in the United States is an area of outstanding beauty with dangerous extremes. It can be bitterly cold during the winter months, and storms in the mountains can produce sudden flash flooding. In contrast, the air temperature during the summer has been as high as 57 degrees Celsius. But don't be fooled by its breathtaking beauty, as it lives up to its name and has claimed many victims over the years. We'll look at just four of them. The Death Valley Germans, as dubbed by the media, were a family of four German tourists who went missing in the valley on July 23, 1996. The family consisted of 34-year-old German architect Egbert Rimkus, his 11-year-old son, 27-year-old girlfriend, and her four-year-old son Max, all of whom were from Dresden in Germany. The group had arrived in the United States in early July, initially arriving in Los Angeles, before visiting Las Vegas, where they stayed at the Treasure Island Hotel and Casino. Wanting to add more adventure to their vacation, the family travelled to Death Valley on July 22nd, where they bought a booklet from the Furnace Creek Visitor Centre and spent their first night camping out in a canyon near Telescope Peak. The next day the group continued to travel to various visitor sites, with the girlfriend Cornelia signing the names of all the family members on a visitor log at an abandoned mining camp and stopping at the geologist's cabin in Warm Springs Canyon. The family had booked aeroplane seats to return to Germany on July 27th, but never arrived. Rumkus's ex-wife became concerned when her ex-husband and son did not return from their vacation, and she began to inquire about their whereabouts. On July 31st, the German travel agency that arranged the vacation contacted the rental car agency the family had used, and they confirmed the rental had not been returned. After the travel agency failed to establish the family's whereabouts, it reported the family missing to Interpol. On October 21st, the family's green Plymouth Voyager rental car was discovered in an extremely remote part of the park, known as Anvil Canyon by a helicopter search pilot. A subsequent inspection found all four of the tyres were flat and the wheels damaged, and the car had been driven on them for over two miles. Over 200 search and rescue workers performed an extensive search of the area near the car. The search failed to yield any clues to the whereabouts of the family, except for a single beer bottle that was discovered under a bush over a mile away from the abandoned car. 
On October 26, 1996, authorities called off the search for the missing tourists. 13 years later, on November 12, 2009, Les Walker and Tom Mahout, two hikers who were off-duty search and rescuers, who had been searching for traces of the family for years, discovered the skeletal remains of two adults, one male and one female. With identification belonging to the missing tourist strewn nearby, Tess revealed that although DNA was only recovered from the bones of Rankus, authorities were fairly certain that the bones belonged to the missing Germans. Although the remains of the children were never officially discovered, however a shoe, possibly from where the children was found. So what happened to this fit and healthy family of four? Well, as you would expect, when they first disappeared, all sorts of conspiracy theories emerged, including alien abduction and deliberate disappearances, so Edgar could avoid a custody battle with his ex-wife. However, Tom Mahood, who helped find the tourist remains, has his own theory. He believes that while vacationing in Death Valley, the family, short on money, attempted to take a shortcut through a valley and underestimated the difficulty. After their car became stranded in a wash, the family attempted to travel southward towards the restricted area of Naval Air Weapons Station China Lake, where they expected to find a well-guarded and attended perimeter, a much more common feature of German military bases. But in the searing heat and without proper equipment or clothing suitable for the tough terrain, the family eventually had to stop, and they all ultimately succumbed to the environment and unforgiving territory of Death Valley. A tragic story, but also a warning that things are not always what they seem, and the power of nature should never be underestimated. If you want a more in-depth look at how the remains of the Death Valley Germans were located, a link in the description offers an excellent insight from Tom and the man whose persistence finally found them. Hanbury Crater it might surprise you to know that one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history was in the UK. The incident occurred at RAF Fold, a bomb dump in a disguised gypsum mine in Staffordshire, England. At 11.11am on Monday, November 27th, 1944, there was a massive explosion at the site, and eyewitnesses reported seeing two distinct columns of black smoke in the form of a mushroom cloud, ascending several thousand feet into the sky with a blaze at the foot of them. An initial statement issued by commanding officer, Captain Stora, stated that the blaze was caused by an open dump of incendiary bombs that caught fire and was allowed to burn itself out without damage or casualties. The reality was that between 3,500 and 4,000 tons of ammunition had been detonated. That included high explosive filled bombs, a variety of other types of weapons, and 500 million rounds of rifle ammunition. The effect was devastating. Buildings within a three quarter mile radius of the site were damaged. A nearby farm was obliterated and a lime and gypsum works to the north of Hanbury village, as well as a row of cottages that were completely destroyed by the destruction of a nearby 450,000 cubic meter reservoir that also drowned 37 people as well as 200 cattle. The explosion caused a crater with a depth of 300 feet or 91 meters and 250 yards or 230 meters across that is still visible today. Despite nature doing its best to cover it, it is now known as the Hanbury Crater. In the aftermath of the incident, it was unclear exactly how many people had died because at the time there was no accurate tally of the number of workers at the facility. So while the exact death toll is uncertain, it appears that about 70 people died in the explosion, although it could have been as many as 90. It was years before the truth emerged, when it transpired that at the time of the blast, there had been staff shortages at the site and a lack of management, as well as 189 inexperienced Italian POWs working there. It wasn't until 1974 that it was announced that the cause of the explosion was probably a site worker removing a detonator from a live bomb using a brass chisel rather than a wooden baton. This was confirmed by an eyewitness. Another remarkable fact is that parts of the mine and much of the stored ammunition survived the explosion due to the barriers of rock pillars between the sections that prevented the other munition storage areas from exploding in a chain reaction. So the facility continued to be used by the RAF until 1966 
After this, the site was used by the US Army until 1973 to store US ammunition, previously stored in France. This was remarkable when you consider it was known that several unexploded bombs were and still are nestled in the crater. By 1979, the site was fenced off and the area is now covered with over 150 species of trees and wildlife. The area is restricted as the explosives are still buried deep in the site after the UK government deemed their removal unfeasible on the grounds of cost. Until recently, it was possible to enter the underground facilities, although now all the entrances have been sealed up and visitors are not permitted to enter the crater. Two memorials have been constructed close to the site to remember the dead. Also ominously, there is a sign warning of unexploded munitions and the hazard posed by the crater. So that's five locations around the world that have dark and disturbing histories and backstories. We hope you've enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.